Well, invariably in these presentations, I speak too quickly, so this will be prompt as I appreciate I'm between you and lunch too. So um, today, folks, I'm just going to take an opportunity to speak briefly about our experience with using the ABC to VLE methodology um, as part of a learning enhancement initiative in UCC. And I refer to it as our pedagogical Swiss Army knife. So I suppose no talk about ABC to VLE is going to be is going to start without thanks and thanks here go to Clive Young and Natasha Perovich for actually devising the methodology and for sharing it and having the press and the presence of mind to share it under a Creative Commons license which allows us all to use it and reuse their resources. To Diane Larlard who actually came up with the pedagogical underpinnings for it with learning types in 2012. And a big shout out to DCU for all their work in promoting and advancing the methodology which brought it to, to the attention of UCC. And then to uh, my former boss, Dr. Catherine O'Mahony, who had the, <laughs> she had the misfortune of enlisting me into the Centre for the Integration of Research, Teaching and Learning in 2020. And the core brief I was into, uh, when I was brought in was to run these workshops to try to, and we have the rationale, to take a more proactive approach to curriculum design, to meet new academics. And when I say new academics, I don't mean new hires. I suppose we've all seen it in our organizations that when we run uh, professional development activities within an organization, we see the same faces all the time. That's not a criticism. It's great to see an engaged cohort. But if you want to widen the cohort, you need a, a new activity and a new approach. And this was deemed a very um, open and um, approachable um, means of um, reaching some new academics and having new faces at these events. And from my perspective, we provided a common language for academics and administrative staff to discuss their learning and their learners and learning outcomes. Um, it, as an instructional designer, it was a methodology I wish I'd engaged with sooner because it would make the process of designing um, online learning far easier, in my opinion. So what I'll quickly run through in the 10 minutes or so is I'll speak about our initial experience, which was suitably brief January to March 2020 with face to face learning design workshops. What we did from June that year up until about September with some online learning design workshops, how we moved and what we did in terms of ad hoc or on demand learning design workshops. And then we shall I'll speak about um, the, the more structured approach we took with the Connected Curriculum Initiative in um, April into June 2021. So the in-person learning design workshops will be familiar to most of you. It followed the standard model. It was multidisciplinary. We had uh, a group of 20 or 30 in a room. We broke them up into uh, smaller groups who sat at tables and engaged with the physical artifacts, the whiteboard, the paper, the post-its. The methodology, for those who are unfamiliar, and I'll run through this suitably quickly, you commence with a module summary, which is basically summarize your module or your learning activity in a tweet. You, you complete a learning types activity graph. You complete a blended learning graph to see where you fit from on the spectrum from online to face to face. You complete the most substantive piece, which is the storyboard where you storyboard your course. And then you conclude with an action plan, which is where you assign what needs to be done next and who needs to do it. So this was what the original page looked like. And this is a screenshot I took from uh, Google Jamboard, which is where we morphed it to. And as you can see, the box there is the tweet where you would complete it. Then you have your um, graph where you complete your diagram to see where you fall in terms of the, the six particular learning types. And then you have your blended learning graph at the bottom. And then you have your storyboard with your they used to be kind of cue card shaped items that you'd use to populate your storyboard, but we basically had a series of JPEGs that people could drag and drop onto their own storyboard. Those cue cards related to learning styles and learning activities. They were grouped into acquisition, investigation, discussion, collaboration, acquisition and production. Um, hopefully they're self-explanatory, but if anyone has any questions about those, I'd, uh, I'll answer them as best I can afterwards. When we when we returned to learning design in June following the um, the first lockdown, we were they were going to be online um, and we spent a lot of time pondering how we would do that best online. What we decided to do initially was to use Miro, the whiteboarding tool, and to use Zoom for effectively for its breakout room functionality. Um, I, I appreciate Zoom has functioned suboptimally today, and I shall take so, more than a small amount of personal responsibility for that. But Zoom as a tool is very reliable, and it has breakout rooms which are 
peerless in the space, to my estimation. So we wanted that breakout rooms. We wanted the ability to break people into groups to discuss the various learning activities. And we couldn't do that within what was that was, was available in Microsoft Teams at the time. When we opened it up to registrations initially, we got very large numbers. Um, so we would it wouldn't have been unknown in the first few weeks of this to run um, learning design workshops where you had upwards of 75 or 100 people which means we needed multiple facilitators. We would have had 15 or plus breakout rooms. It was still multidisciplinary. Everyone still needed that introductory piece. So the icebreaker activity, which was that tweet at the beginning, was still very much to the fore. It was still very much there. And the what we lacked here due to the amount of the numbers and I suppose the sheer scale of it at that point was the follow-up afterwards. That was a point that we recognized was a a kind of a blind spot for us. We weren't seeing how they were taking their action plan and progressing it to the next stage afterwards. While this was ongoing and also um, right through until um, with the online workshops, we had, we, we, I suppose, we made these as adaptable as possible. Um, the ad, I think this speaks to the ad hoc ones. Drop it, drop it. Yeah, so, <laughs> excuse me for a moment. So, well, what I liked about the learning design workshops is we could adapt certain components so we could drop or add an element if we needed it. So if we had a cohort where we were a single discipline who were from a, one school or were from one project or were working on one learning object and were familiar with each other, what we would ultimately do is we would drop the icebreaker initiative or we'd drop another component. So we were able to adapt the learning and design workshop to various tasks. We undertook an entire undergrad curriculum review at History. Um, there was a focus on creating 360 degree videos for VR and basically we created shot lists and asset descriptions from the learning design uh, from a learning design workshop. But that learning design workshop focused almost exclusively on the storyboard component and identified where best within the learning activities we would want to situate one of those uh, learning objects effectively. So we went to individual learning objects whereby we were talking about particular quizzes or we were talking about a particular sequence or how to address a particular topic. And we also looked at entirely new program um, development de novo, which was interesting in that it's not, I suppose, saddled with some of the legacy issues. Um, one of the challenges I came across personally and that Catherine um, helped, I suppose, mentor out of me to an extent was I'm an instructional designer, so I'm, I, I specialize in getting lost in the weeds, the how the thing is built, the nuts and bolts of how it's going to be put together, what's going to report. This whole uh, methodology works best when you kind of zoom out a little bit and take a more helicopter view of the program um, or the object that you're looking to create. The ad hoc sessions moved to Google Jamboard and they stayed more within the UCC ecosystem. So we did eventually migrate to Microsoft Teams, which eventually brought out breakout rooms after a fashion. It did add some technological challenges to our implementation, but the the ad hoc sessions continued. Um, a department would request one, we would schedule one as and when um, as and when we could, and we would have a more measured follow up with them because they weren't coming with such frequency and at such, at such scale. In April, as part of the connected curriculum activities within UCC, there was a move to embed um, civic engagement and sustainability more in certain modules. So an open call was published um, and people were asked to submit projects where they would like to embed elements of sustainability or elements of civic engagement in their um, modules or curricula and uh, I believe eight projects in total were selected. Um, I'm open to correction on that. The time has d uh, dulled my memory a little bit on that I'm afraid. Um, but what we did is we structured this in terms of pre and post. So before they attended the first workshop, before they attended the first learning design workshop, we had a lot of um, content that was available on a module on Canvas. So this was this set up the learning activities, gave them the context for the module and the context for the sustainability or civic engagement components we wanted to add. Likewise, afterwards, a series of meetings were scheduled with mentors. And in that case, within within Circle, we had um, we had 
rep, we had colleagues who were working specifically in those areas and they, John Barmo would have met to speak about sustainability and he would have met with his groups once or twice to walk them through how they would affect module change. And the idea was that it would affect module change. So this would be facilitated and it would be followed up that they would make an actual change to their module description. What made this connected curriculum session work particularly well and I suppose what gave it to a certain extent a lot of life and energy was that it was deliberately designed with uh, student co-collaboration of the curriculum in mind. So each of the groups, if you were an academic whose module was accepted, the onus was on you to select four students who would also attend a session with you. And between you both, you would come up with the best means of crafting this module update. And you would then have been part of um, the co-development of that curriculum, so to speak. That led to an awful lot more engaging conversations, I suppose, within the structure of the learning design workshop. And when everyone was sent to breakout rooms, it was the individual academic responsible for the module and the students of that module who were sent to those breakout rooms. So this wasn't, it was multidisciplinary to set the stage in the context, but it wasn't multidisciplinary in the breakout rooms where the substantive work was done. I suppose quickly for the lessons learned in the UCC context, um, I, I dabble in photography and what I like about the learning design workshop is it provides a zoom range so you can focus up real close on something or you can zoom back out if you wish. So you can go from a learning object to a multi-annual curriculum. What we're working on and although I'm not quite in UCC's house anymore, um, we're developing a train to trainer approach still and I'm completing the resources for that. So that'll be something that will of course be Creatively Commons licensed but the idea is we would enable staff to um, run their own or as I was saying, guide themselves through the learning design process should they so need to. Um, in my post UCC context this is a methodology that I've continued to deploy with my company and we look in with one client they were looking to procure a learning management system that learning management system the specification list did not bear any reference to the learning activities that would require it so we we went to the learning, we used the learning design workshop, the ABC to VLE methodology to map their learning activities. And then we were able to assign VLE tools to those learning activities and get a more uh, reasonable list of LMS requirements, shall we say. And generally speaking, for a lot of clients who are asking for new new courses or new development at this point, the needs assessment would almost start with um, a, a version of a learning design workshop to establish what exactly they mean. So we can establish core definitions, common definitions, and we can move from there then. Thanks, Patrick. So that's me. That's, that's time. That's fair enough. My apologies. I actually filled up the entire time. There we go. You did. You did. Well done. You said you wouldn't, but you did. Uh, thank you very much. That was a, a brilliant whistle stop tour through uh, ABC to VLE. Um, so I'd just like to say, to open to the floor, does anybody have any questions for Patrick at this point? Lunch. <laughs> Lunch. Yeah, well, in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, we're, we're quite familiar with ABC and uh, DCU. Um, so I'd just be interested in the last minute that we have before lunch uh, in your thoughts in that movement from a face to face process to an online process. And certainly the numbers you mentioned, 70. Um, I've never seen it used in conjunction with numbers that large. The challenge with numbers that large ultimately was the amount of facilitators in the breakout room. So it was it, you would no longer have one facilitator or maybe even two facilitators in a room. You would need five or six and you would each be assigned to maybe two or three breakout rooms. It did present logistical challenges at that point. And I think that there was a pent up demand for people to take a I suppose people felt, especially with the onset of the pandemic initially, I think that they lost a certain degree of agency. And the call happened to come around the time where the on first run through online exams had been completed. And I think people were reclaiming an element of their agency and were hoping to look to their curriculum and try to redesign it. But as we've learned with the pandemic, they were trying to hit a more, very much a moving target, so to speak, because you design a a new intriguing form of in-person assessment and that has then nerfed by the next wave so it's um it's still a methodology that will be used but i don't know if it'll necessarily be used in ucc at those numbers again um but it was it definitely met the brief and the requirements at that particular point 